The NFL Draft begins tomorrow. What should the Jets do? We'll try and figure it out on today's mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Wednesday, April 27th, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from gangreennation.com. And I thank you for making this show your first listen or your first watch every day. We're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit that subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. Helps other Jets fans find the channel. Today, our episode is brought to you by Blue Nile. This Mother's Day, give mom something she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com. And Locked On Sports listeners get $50 off $500 purchases. Use code LOCKEDON at checkout. Well, today we have our weekly mailbag show, our final mailbag before the NFL draft begins tomorrow. Obviously, a very important NFL draft for the Jets. I mean, they're all important, but this year the Jets have two of the top 10 picks, four of the top 40 Five of the top 70, seven of the top 120. So big opportunity for this team to turn things around, improve the talent base on this roster. And we get to the mailbag now. Let's begin. Our first question is about Debo Samuel. It's not about the draft, actually, because there are all sorts of rumors about Debo Samuel. So our first question goes, the Jets have the second most draft capital since 1999 and the third most since 1970. Even with two first-round picks and two second-round picks, there are no guarantees any will be a star. Some might be starters. Others could be busts. Debo Samuel is 26 years old and a proven entity. He's worked with Salah and LaFleur and is a perfect fit for a similar offense. We have nobody outside of Moore for the future and Davis possibly for this year at the wide receiver position. I don't see much in the draft that has anything close to his potential, much less an immediate impact as a starter. Would you give both picks four and pick 10 for Debo? What is the price you would say no to? What is the price you would say yes to? I would not give picks both picks four and 10 for Debo Samuel. And I think the Jets should absolutely be all in on Debo Samuel. Four and 10 is too high. Four and 10, I think, is like we've reached the Jamal Adams territory where we've given up too much. And that it it takes a lot for me to say that because I've been on the bandwagon of trading for an established receiver all offseason. So the fact I'm saying this shows you I, I think it's probably a little bit too rich of a price to give up for a Debo Samuel. Now the Jets should be all in on Debo Samuel. They should do everything within reason to try and get him, I think, because as you mentioned, perfect fit for this offense. And beyond that, a guy who could really help Zach Wilson. You know, I, I've been looking through the way NFL quarterbacks have developed recently. And you see, I mean the guys who develop, they tend to have premium pieces around them on the offensive side of the ball, especially at the wide receiver position. It's interesting because I've seen a lot of the argument that the Jets need to get a good receiver in here so that they can evaluate whether Zach Wilson is actually the future or not. Because the I think the idea is that if you don't have good weapons around him, it's difficult to say, you know, things don't work out. You could say, well, is it Zach? Is it the weapons? I've been thinking this through. I don't know that I agree with that. I mean, you think about recent Jets history. The year the Jets gave up on Mark Sanchez, that was after the 2012 season, really. Jeff Cumberland was his second leading receiver that year. I mean, it took the Jets two years to give up on Geno Smith. They did not really put the right pieces around Geno. Sam Darnold, it took them three years to give up on him. And, you know, the three years, giving up the three years for, uh, for a guy, on a guy who you traded up to get, who you traded three second round picks to get, and you give up on him after three years. That's a that's a pretty quick move. Um, even Christian Hackenberg, who, you know, didn't even, didn't even take him a snap for the Jets to figure out he couldn't play. So I don't know that I really agree that you need a receiver to evaluate a quarterback. I think you can evaluate quarterbacks independently of how good their receiving core is. I think the reason you get a Debo Samuel is that history's shown us, I've, recent history in the NFL has shown us, whether you're talking about you know Josh Allen after his breakout season after the Bills got Stephon Diggs. I mean, any almost any quarterback you could look at who's developed has had premium weapons around him. You know, sometimes it's like Russell Wilson, where the premium weapon is a running back in Marshawn Lynch, and he had the great defense. But 
if you're going to develop a quarterback, you got to put the right pieces around him. So I think the Jets should absolutely be all in on Debo, but every player, there's a price where it's just too much. Four and 10, that's too much. See, I'm okay with giving up 10 because at 10, the odds are very much against you getting a player as good as Debo Samuel. I mean, yeah, and it's especially true at the wide receiver position, but you can make the argument, okay, well, even if it's not a wide receiver, maybe you can get a player who's just as good, just as valuable in another position. It's difficult to do that with just 10. But if you got two shots at it in the top 10, if you got four and 10 with both of those picks, you probably should be able to find a player who's as valuable as, as Debo Samuel. And the other thing about Debo, you have to remember, you're going to have to give him a big extension. And the rumor is around you know $25 million a year. Now, in reality, if you give up 10, it's probably more like 19 to $20 million a year because pick 10 is going to make a con- going to make around five, five and a half million dollars a year. So it's not, so you have to factor that in. You take that out. Um, so I'd give up pick 10. I think that's a very competitive offer. If you look at the other deals this off season, I mean, here's the thing is Miami gave up to, you know, 29 and 30 for Tyreek Hill. We're talking about giving up four and 10 for Debo Samuel. There has to be some discount built, built in because the picks are higher here. So I can't get behind the idea of giving up four and 10 for Debo. 10 is a very competitive offer. I mean, 10 is essentially, if you use, and I, I don't, I always go back to this. I don't believe that the Jimmy Johnson chart is an accurate representation of true value, but it's the, the measure teams use for value. 10 is about the same as what the Jets offered for Tyreek Hill. So if you offer four and 10, you're saying, you're essentially saying Debo Samuel is like way more valuable as a player on the field than Tyreek Hill. You know, the market's set. And if you can't get him for 10, then somebody else is probably overpaid. So by all means, be aggressive. And listen, there's no doubt that the Jets should trade 10 in my mind and give Debo Samuel that big contract. But adding a second, adding a top 10 pick, adding a top five pick to pick 10, I mean, pick 10 should be enough. If some team wants to beat pick 10, then yeah, you're going to have a tough time at the receiver position, but that's not really because of, you missed on Debo Samuel. It's because some team offered a crazy packet for Debo Samuel. The sin would then be more of what you did previously to this point in the offseason, leaving yourself in a position where you did not have many options. Your only options were either overpay Debo Samuel or not get a receiver. And at that point, I just can't justify the idea that you're going to give up two top 10 picks. There's one pick in the top five for Debo Samuel. Ten, uh, to me, 10 is the price. That's like the take it or leave it price for San Francisco because you're also giving a, you know you're also giving Debo a pretty big contract. At some point, the resources just be every player. There's a point where it's just too many resources to invest in them. So t- that's where I draw the line. I say you can have ten. If somebody outbids us, that's fine. But that that to me that's that's got to be the price. I, I don't see I don't see how you go beyond ten. Our next question, John. This will be Joe Douglas's third draft. We're getting a lot of impact players back from injury. We had a pretty good free agency, and there should be a natural progression of last year's rookie class. So with the most draft capital and four top 38 picks, what does the team need to do this weekend to be in the playoff hunt towards the end of the season and finally begin playing competitive football? Well, I go back to the quarterback position. And, you know, when the quarterback takes off, the team improves a lot quicker than anybody expects them to. And, I, you know, I, I, I hate using the Cincinnati example, first of all, because I always use the Cincinnati example this year because you know, obviously they're the obvious choice. But nobody had that team doing what they did this year, and it was because Joe Burrow succeeded. The quarterback has a way of improving things very quickly. So if Zach Wilson you know, if Zach Wilson becomes you know, like even like a middle-of-the-pack starting quarterback this year, that's going to have a big impact on the Jets, I think. I think I think that's the type of thing that could have a tremendous positive uh move for the because you know the, the Jets the last couple of years one of the reasons they've been one of the worst teams in the league is that they've gotten bottom of the league quarterback play first from Sam and last year from Zach so if you improve the most important position on the field suddenly your team's a lot more competitive suddenly you're going to win a lot more games the other thing is you know draft picks have a tendency of you know, you if you hit on them they have a bigger impact than you realize and the point I I've been making frequently is there's this idea that you cannot have any weaknesses on your roster that's not really true, though. What wins you games is not necessarily a wa- lack of weakness. Now, weaknesses can lose you games, but having a complete roster, there are very few teams in the league who have a complete roster. You, know, you want to compete for a Super Bowl, it certainly helps, but I, I don't think the Jets are really in a spot where they're competing for a Super Bowl yet. You just got to have impact players. So it's not. So, so I, I focus less on the specific positions these players play because you can build a successful team 
a number of, there's a number of different ways you can build a successful team. There are a number of different ways you can build strengths that can overwhelm an opponent. Right now, the biggest problem with the Jets is not it's not weakness at one position or another. It's the lack of overall impact. It's the lack of game changing talent on this team. So, it's for me, it's less important which specific players the Jets draft. So I'm not going to like go into like the Jets need to. I mean, the Jets need to get a receiver, but outside of that, I'm not going to get into like the Jets need to address X position or Y position with these picks. It's just more they got to get great players in here because there's just not enough great players. That's the re- I mean, that's the reason above all else the Jets have won only six games the last two years. Lack of great players. Where these guys play to me matters significantly less than the fact that than them being great. So hit on some of these picks. And the Jets don't need to go four for four. I've seen people say, well, the Jets are Jets are gonna get four starters. Jets need to get four starters in the top thirty-eight. That's not how it works. You're always gonna miss on picks. The reason the thing the reason having extra picks is great is that it builds in some margin for error because every GM is human. Everybody's gonna miss picks. And by the way, evaluating prospects is very difficult. Now it doesn't hurt as much if you, you know, if you miss on four, it doesn't hurt as much because you got a second chance at 10. You miss at 35, it doesn't hurt as much because you got a second chance at 38. So just a couple of players, you know, a couple of impact guys who can step in immediately would, would play a big role on this team. And I know I missed or don't count on rookies, but, you know, four top 38 picks, I think you, you should be able to find some instant impact players here if you're doing your job right. You know, maybe not if you just have four and 35, then it might be tougher, but with double early first round picks and double early second round picks, you've d- doubled your chances of finding somebody who could step in right away. So I think the expectations are a little different, but it's probably not as inconceivable as people make it out to be. Jets just need to do the right things and the quarterback needs to grow. Now ahead here on the Lockdown Jets podcast, we will continue talking about the upcoming draft and we will talk about the wide receiver position. It's a position I've been talking about all off season. I'll give you some thoughts on some lesser prospects who could interest the Jets. That's a hit head here on this Wednesday mailbag Locked On Jets episode. Of course, the NFL draft is almost here, and that means Mother's Day is only a few weeks away. And whether your mom prefers a statement piece or everyday subtle elegance, BlueNile.com has the jewelry collection for every mom. Shop high-quality classic diamond earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, or gemstone pendant necklaces. Mark Mother's Day with something enduring, classic diamond stud earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, birthstone pendants, and so much more on BlueNile.com. If you're celebrating the special woman in your life at BlueNile.com, you can easily navigate thousands of jewelry options on every price point. This Mother's Day, give mom something she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On Sports listeners get $50 off $500 purchases. This podcast exclusive is good only through Mother's Day. Use code Locked On. That's code Locked On, one word with no space, L O C K E D O N. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress free and find that forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. Thank you again for making Locked On Jets your first listen every day. And for the first time ever, Locked On is hosting live coverage of the 2022 NFL draft from our studios in Dallas with pick by pick analysis from our local team experts and draft gurus. Tune in all three days as our draft team guides you through every pick and every trade in real time. It starts on Thursday, April 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern, available on Locked On NFL YouTube and on the Odyssey app. And today we are having our final mailbag before the 2022 NFL Draft. And our next question comes about the wide receiver position. John, I'd love to see the Jets double dip in wide receiver in their first four picks and tool Wilson up with more weapons. Outside of the big six receivers in this class, who is the wideout you see with the most upside or best scheme fit who may slip to the early second round? So that depends on who you think the sixth receiver is, because I see like I see the top big big five right now. And I I think that that's um, Wilson, London, Williams, Olave and Burks. So I, I don't know if Christian Watson's your sixth receiver. If he is, then my guy would be Sky Moore, who I think would be a good fit. It also, like, I feel like. If you are looking to double dip at receiver, the guy you pick first is probably going to profile as more of an outside receiver. And I think Sky Moore is going to be a good, very good slot receiver. So I, 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 my mindset would, if for that question, would probably be more in the slot than it would be on the outside. So I, I think Sky Moore is a guy who makes sense. You know, if you go a little bit later, I don't know that he's a second round guy, but uh, Calvin Austin out of Memphis, a guy with a lot of speed, 
a lot of playmaking ability. Who's you know, he's small, so he, again, this is another guy who's probably a slot receiver for the Jets. But that would be the other guy who comes to mind. Uh, Pierce out of Cincinnati, I think, is a good fit. He's a bigger guy, uh, but I, I like him as well. So those are some. Those are a couple guys I could see. You know, potentially day two if you decide to double dip at the receiver position. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting. It, it it always depends on what you do in the first round. It. It's one of the reasons it's always difficult when people ask me questions about what do you do on day two. What the Jets do in the first round is going to do a lot to dictate your strategy on day two. So it's always a little bit difficult. It's always easier to answer questions in the first round because the situation, it could be wildly different depending on what the Jets do in the first. By day two, the situation could be wildly different depending on the scenario that plays out for the Jets in the first round. So it, it's always a little tricky to answer, but... I don't hate the idea of double dipping at the receiver position because you look at it right now, uh, you know, you need a receiver because right now Barrios is really more of a backup as your starting slot receiver. But beyond that, I mean, I don't know that Corey Davis is a long-term player for this team, which means that this would be a good year to try and draft his replacement, let that guy develop slowly, especially if it's going to be a day two pick. So, you know, it's diff- it's tricky to say. It depends on what the Jets do in the first round, but those are some of the names who come to mind for me. Our next question. I just saw a rumor that uh, Carl Loffis, Dean, and Linderbaum may found, fall to round two. Well, I don't think they're all dropping that far. Would any of those guys justify tr- uh, trading back into the bottom of round one for a reasonable cost? So I have to say this. I am very anti the Jets trading up in this draft because Jets need a lot. They have a lot of picks and they need them all. I know that there's a tendency to think, well, with all these picks, now you can move around, you can get where you want to go. And there's something to that. But I mentioned this earlier, the margin of error. I I like the idea that you're building in a margin of error because you're not going to hit on all of your picks. The Jets just need a lot. So generally speaking, I'm against trading up. The one scenario you could talk me into, though, is the one you're laying out because the general consensus is that there is a lack of elite level talent in this draft. So if you get into like the twenties and there are guys available to you who you think, you know, this is the last player we have graded as an elite level talent. He's not going to fall to us at 35. We got to get up into the, we got to get up and get a third first round pick. We got to move up from 35. That's where I could justify it. That's maybe the one spot where I don't hate the idea of trading up. And the, the other, the only thing I'll say is that, I really would like to avoid giving up a pick higher than a fifth round pick. I can live with it in that situation if you're giving up a four, but I do not want to give up a three. Jets gave up both of their third round picks last year for Vera Tucker to move up, and that was fine. I don't have an issue with that, but I think that means you know you got to build some balance in here. I don't like having two straight years without third round picks, even with all the extra picks the Jets have. I, I you know they they made their move last year with the third round picks. This year, let's keep the third round pick. And I would even like, you know, the Jets have two fourth round picks and like both of these picks are kind of in like the the range of the draft where typically you still have a reasonable shot of getting a player. I've looked, I looked through this and like, it's like the mid to late fourth round is the point where your the quality of the players typically starts really falling off. And that's kind of the the stage where picks become way less valuable. It doesn't really matter if you trade them because guys you get probably aren't going to be that good. So I feel like the Jets picks in the fourth round are still in that range where you could get something, get a player who's reasonably good. So I'd like to hold on to those fourth round picks. But if there's like one guy they still have graded as elite and you get into like the mid to late 20s and you have to power part with one of those fourth round picks. I mean, I I could live with that, Uh, but I'd be very hesitant otherwise to trade up in this draft because you need so much and you've got all these picks. You know, yeah, you have a lot of draft capital. Yeah, you could trade it, but. One of the things that's great about having draft capital is that you can bring in a big rookie class who can make an immediate impact. So I would not, you know, I'd be very hesitant to, to give up any of those picks uh, just for, for those reasons. Now ahead here on the Locked On Jets podcast, we're going to close out our weekly mailbag. We're going to talk offensive line. We're going to talk prospects. We're going to talk somebody who's already here and his future. That's ahead here as we close out this pre-draft mailbag show. Of course, the NFL draft begins tomorrow night. I hope you've got the, all the snacks you need. And you should, if you don't have it yet, you should get Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar on the market. At Built Bar, they figure out how to make it delicious first, and then they figure out how to make it healthy. And they manage to do both. All bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, so you know they're delicious. 
You got mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, a bunch of other great flavors, but they're also healthy. Most bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. Check out all the flavors for yourself. Go to built.com, and if you like something, buy it. And while you're checking out, use promo code LOCK15. If you do that, I'll give a little tip. You get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15. It's one word with no space. L-O-C-K-E-D, number one, number five. For 15% off at Built, B-U-I-L-T dot com for delicious Built Bars. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Mailbag Wednesday show. Our next question, is Trevor Penning in play at 10? I don't think you can rule him out. There was so much buzz around him. At the, at the Senior Bowl, and the Jets were coaching him. There was talk about how, how much Joe Douglas loved him. So I don't think you can rule it out. I don't think that would be a very popular pick. I think there are a lot of people who would have a problem with that pick. But I think it's certainly possible that the Jets could be in play for Trevor Penning. I, I think, you know, I, I don't – it's difficult to say. I mean, this is this is silly season. I mean, there's rumors about everybody. But, you know, going back to the – you know, I, I – completely disregard anything i've heard in the last week because this is just like constant smoke screens nothing you've heard over the last few days is anything other than a smoke screen but before that when you were learning you know relatively more accurate information you you would what you would assume is relatively more accurate rumors there was lots of talk about the jets loving trevor penning so i would not be i think i think that's a wild card i I, you know you don't see him projected much to the jets I, i would not be completely it's not the most likely scenario but I would not be completely shocked if Trevor Penning went to the Jets at 10. And I think especially if the Jets, you know, executed a trade down either from 4 or 10, then I think, you know, he really could be in play there. Next question. I keep hearing the argument that the Jets should not draft an offensive tackle because of Fant. But Fant is not under contract past 2022, and I have not heard any rumors of an effort to extend Fant to be the starting tackle. Would you agree that as long as Fant hasn't been extended, then there's no reason to not draft a tackle at 4 or 10? Yeah, that's the thing. I always look two years down the road. Now, if Fant had been extended, and you know he's going to be, you know, he's going to be on the team the next two to three years, then I, I wouldn't see the logic behind drafting a tackle unless you were completely not sold on Becton. But Fant could be gone in a year, so like I don't have an issue drafting a guy to be a backup year one. I only have an issue drafting a guy to be a backup year two in the top ten. But, you know, giving a guy a chance to kind of learn on the sideline, I don't think that that's a horrible scenario because I don't really – a lot of times you don't get much from a rookie anyway. So I don't have a big problem with it. If I know it would not – again, that's another move that would not be popular for the Jets, but I, I could see it happening. I, and I, I, I agree. I think, you know, you look – for me, it's like you look two years out. I look to year two typically what you can get from – and I know I – I know I just talked about how you should expect immediate contributions in an earlier segment here, but generally speaking, I, I don't care as much about what you provide as a rookie as I do about the longer term value. Because for me, the draft is not so much about filling immediate needs. It's more about making sure positions cease to be needs for the next decade. If you get a great player, that position is not going to be a need for the next decade. And that's, that's really the point of the draft more than it is dealing with immediate issues with your team. So I would agree with that. I think, you know, if, if Fant is not a lock to be here in the future, well, then next year you're going to find yourself in a spot where you need, need a tackle, and then you're going to be in a more desperate situation. I always like addressing needs. I always like being proactive addressing situations like this rather than putting yourself in a position, well, like the Jets find themselves at wide receiver where they have to do something. You know, that that's where you start to make mistakes. That's where you make moves you regret. So this would be a case of being proactive if you draft a tackle and you don't think Fant's going to be here for the long run. And our last question, what are the Jets going to do in the first round? Well, if I knew that, then I probably wouldn't, you know, I'd probably be doing something a little bit different. Um, I'm just guessing here. It's an educated guess. But one thing we know about Joe Douglas, Joe Douglas has not really kept his cards tight in his time as Jets general manager heading into the draft. I mean, in 2020, I think we all kind of knew he was drafting a tackle in the first round and a receiver in the second round. Last year, it was no secret the Jets were drafting Zach Wilson second second overall, which is a little different scenario because Lawrence was going to Jacksonville number one and nobody could jump the Jets for Zach Wilson. But So I guess I look at this, and prior to the last few days where there's been rumors nonstop, 
ever since the end of free agency, the the consensus has been the Jets were probably taking a defensive end at four and a receiver at ten. You know, which will it be? Uh, who knows? It depends on who's available. But I think the most likely scenario remains in, until it doesn't happen. My guess is going to be defensive end at four, receiver at ten. But you know, anything could happen, and what happens with those first three picks before the Jets pick at four, and what happens between five and nine will also impact those things. So that's just an educated guess and, you know, could very well be wrong. But based on what we've known up until the last few days, it's been most likely scenario uh, defensive end at four receiver at 10. What's changed aside from just like constant rumors being thrown out there because we're nearing the draft. So that's my educated guess. Anyway, that's all for our show today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, if you enjoy the show, subscribe to it. Leave it a five-star review if you're listening on a podcast source, and big thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. It will be draft day. We'll talk about what the Jets are going to do at pick four and pick ten.